The silence is broken by somebody crying Trying to be heard, never a word Always the attitude, sort out your own Always alone, wishing for something The world is denying Out in the wilderness, somebody's crying Somebody wishing for something to happen Wishing to tell, wishing to help Someone was listening, someone who cared Never despaired Someone to lean on and someone to trust Who needs your assistance and finds your disgust Hello my name is Ayana Young, and I welcome you to For the Wild podcast. Today we are speaking with Stephen Jenkinson. Stephen is an activist, teacher, author, and farmer. He has a master's degree in theology from Harvard University and a master's degree in social work from the University of Toronto. Formerly a program director at a major Canadian hospital and medical school assistant professor, Jenkinson is now a sought-after workshop leader, speaker, and consultant to palliative care and hospice organizations. He is the founder of the Orphan Wisdom School in Canada and the subject of the documentary film, Grief Walker. Stephen, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. You write about some of the great, unspoken questions we all face, but don't have the wherewithal to really investigate beyond the common knowledge of the culture we inherit. I admire your writing and you're speaking so much for its clarity and candidness as you challenge some of our deepest assumptions about our purpose. There's no tiptoeing around the indoctrination and taboos most of us hold around ancestry, life, death, and dying. You know, really uncomfortable subjects to many people. It takes time and patience to open to these questions. So it's an honor to join you in this exploration and to direct that light of honesty on some of the shadowy regions some of us seldom stray to. I've been credited with something that people have called brutal honesty, which I really don't take as a compliment. I don't think it's brutal, but I take what you're saying as you know, very complimentary of, the, of what ended up there on the, on the page. Well, it could be jarring to a reader who has never begun to question their indoctrination. I suppose I'm not a mama bird who's chewed it first. <laughs> no, definitely not. But that's part of why you're so sought after as a teacher and why I have no hesitation in asking some of the more challenging questions that afflict my heart. First, I want to begin with a quotation from this beautiful short film you made with Ian McKenzie, The Making of Humans, where you said, quote, The ultimate self-absorption of our age is the self-hatred of our age. The belief nothing we say or do can help but screw things up even worse, end quote. So before seeking out the guidance of teachers such as yourself, I was stuck in the misanthropy of feeling humanity is a cancer, which is a common perception, very related to the shame of being non-native. Could you share some of your thoughts around how self-hatred and its sibling self-glorification limit us and impoverish us, while the source of our shame, the murder of the planet, continues unchallenged? You know, they're, they're the swing arm of the same reflex. You know, one goes one direction, one goes the opposite direction. But there's no, there's no achievement for swinging back and forth like a pendulum, not really. It's a very much a, a kind of machine vision of what sorrow should actually be. I guess I would say that self-hatred and self-glorification, they're the shadow puppetry of self-absorption. That's how it's articulated, the absorption's articulated. I mean, it's in the nature of being self-absorbed to deny that you are or not to be alert to the fact that you are. And 
And this is no solution. This is rather, I would say, that sorrow is being preempted by self hatred, as if by some kind of torturous uh, algebra, you know, one somehow gives rise to the other. Well, it doesn't at all. It's a shell game, you know, self absorption, self hatred, misanthropy. Not to say that they're not understandable. Man, I understand them. You know, I, I, I'm obliged to contend with it on a regular basis whenever I stand before people and uh, respond to these things and others. The fact that it's understandable doesn't make it mandatory, nor does it make it inevitable. So it's not much of an achievement, really, to engage in the game of cursing. And because it's yourself or your kind that you're cursing, it's no greater an achievement than if you were cursing another species or um, another era, human or otherwise. And sorrow has no place in those shenanigans, I'd say. Sorrow is pleading for a seat at the table while all the haters, you know, are flinging food back and forth. And there's not much grace in that arrangement. And the presence of sorrow among us in a time that's pleading for it could be the beginning of the grace that we're trying to accelerate towards by engaging in this misanthropy in the first place. To characterize some people as non-native, the language itself is a pin through the sternum, and it nails for all time the end of certain possibilities. And if anything, maybe the characterization of non-native contributes in its way to the appropriation and the plundering. I'm not saying by this, that everybody's, quote, magically native, quote, or magically indigenous. We know that, you know, history lends us a certain capacity for a recovering psyche. And it whispers to us, you know, there were times when we looked exactly as we do now, when something like sanity may have prevailed, and that when we both had an understanding of home, and a capacity for home, we were as indigenously capable as the people we may now be plundering are. If that's true, it's not a matter of going back, you know, any more than it's a matter of asking indigenous people to be cooler than they are right now by living in teepees again so that we can feel better about everything. And by the same token, I know that for myself, who's got sort of Irish scots ancestry more immediately that there's nobody over there that's waiting for me to come back you know and testify to what became of them when they left i mean basically the dominant culture of north america if i can use a generalization is a disowned thing you know we abandoned uh, by leaving and the consequence of that is that we ourselves have been abandoned to a certain rootlessness and uh, i've come to say that we're now so confounded by the freedom that we sought that we seem to be willy-nilly to trade a kind of freedom that no longer seems free, that is, a homelessness instead. We're willing to trade that for anyone else's home. If we are willing to learn instead of be saved, if we're willing to put the enormous contemplative labor and a labor towards sorrow instead of away from it, maybe there's a chance to actually learn something of one's own dappled ancestry. And I think that's an important word to use, you know. We imagine ancestry, we, we imagine a vector that seems to get narrower as it goes away from us. And we become, claim some kind of single identity, you know. In actual fact, of course, it, it vectors in the opposite direction. As time articulates our ancestry, it widens, not narrows, it widens to the point where the idea of, for example, white supremacy, it's so ludicrous as a historical reality. You know, there's no such thing as the white homeland. There's no, there's no such thing as white people, for crying out loud. So the willingness to think these thoughts and pursue this kind of unbidden contemplation, that there was a time... Well, I'll give you an, an example. I was interviewed recently by a fellow, and halfway through the conversation, he said, I have to confess to you something, that when I first came in contact with what you were doing... I was really dismayed because I liked what I was hearing, and then I, maybe I saw a picture, whatever it was, and I said, oh, quote, another white guy trying to be an Indian, unquote. And uh, he was very dismayed by that. And I had to say to him, you know, I mean, this is what happens if you don't cut your hair. It's not, it has nothing to do with 
trying to be something else. If you don't cut your hair, it's, if you're lucky enough to have hair, it's long. And, you know, in the days before scissors, I said to him, probably a lot of people's hair was long. What throws you off the scent of, you know, the, the kind of varied majesty that you derive from? Such that the whole thing now is shame. That if your appearance, if your language approximates anything that doesn't seem directly hereditary, then it's a shameful proposition. Well, I think this can be countered by learning. First of all, imagining, and then that your imagination is tutored. I mean, it's never been easier, in some respects, to learn something about your own ancestry. It's never been more perplexing, perhaps, to approach such a thing. We have all the technology that we haven't had before, you know, thanks to the Mormons and who knows what other kind of, you know, computer programs, to know one thing and find out many things from it. But I wonder what the learning turns into if the whole thing is informed by a basic shame of secretly believing you come from nothing that has merit and that you, that you are so reluctant to claim an ancestry that seems culpable that pillaging other people's actually looks like compassion or looks like sanity or looks like something, you know, sort of culturally responsible and, and conscience-driven. I think it's probably the absence of conscience. So, you know, I, I've been involved for a long time in the death trade. And I can tell you that when people came to their dying time, no one imagined for th- themselves a conundrum whereby as they were dying, I don't mean the moments of death, I mean, you know, the months preceding it, where life was lived knowing that this is what was happening, that the principal malady, the principal disfigurement that ultimately resulted in in dying people being the heaviest per capita users of sedation uh, in the culture, which is a which is a fact now, that this sedation was prompted the use of it rather was prompted by this complete blank in their imagination of what was to become of them subsequent to dying. And my way of saying it, that has a kind of biblical sound, I suppose, to it is they had no sense of unto whom they were dying. And the terror that ensues is really fathomless, I have to tell you. Uh, Hence the the sedation, hence the antidepressants, you know. Hence the morphine. That's the largest single reason I saw people dying absolutely plowed under. It's because they had no sense of any continuity, no sense of anyone waiting for them, and no sense that there was any achieved status to the people who'd come before them who bequeathed to them their eye color and their, the shape of their chin, and their skin tone, you see. Well, that's a beginning of a response to what you've asked. You've suggested an answer to the conundrum of this colonial orphan situation. Now, there's been this thought process that's been lurking in my mind that I've never fully indulged, that we all have somewhere in us the capacity for home. And to step into a line of ancestry upon our passing, that's such an essential part of the cycle we're being denied because 
were instead lining up to pledge allegiance to a mechanical reality that has created a state of emergency in the natural world. So my reaction to this homelessness is to rebel against an exclusively human ancestry and to rebel against the human supremacy that is so pervasive in this time. In this sense, it's dangerous to limit our sense of identity to a bloodline and a short-term history. What if we identified instead with the wider web, with the plants and animals, and fungi and bacteria? Or how do you see it? Well, it, it wouldn't be bad if people even did that, frankly. Uh, so I'm not sure that I'd use the word dangerous to describe it. I think, if anything, if the question is be, could be, how does a dominant culture, non-aligned person, quote, begin even a contemplative proposition? You know, your human ancestry is not a bad place to begin. And I'd go further and say, you start bringing in mushrooms, you're probably doing that so as not to have to go through the work of facing down the human ancestry that you do not necessarily welcome or feel kinship with or want to in any way be associated with. So I don't think it's dangerous. I think it's mandatory. But yeah, I absolutely take your point, too, that you know we have a, a word, the indigenous people where I live, understand themselves to be Anishinaabe, which most people listening would know is probably as Algonquin locally and the language group more in the direction of Ojibwe or Chippewa, which is the same word. They have a word that is vectored out into the greater English language, and it's mistaken as an English word now. And I'm, I'm talking to you from the west coast of Canada right now, where they have a thing called totem poles. And most people don't know that that word totem is actually this Anishinaabe word I'm referring to. It's dodem. It's a D. It's a softer pronunciation. And it's an eastern woodland word. And the word dodem is too briefly translated as something like clan. It's good as a beginning, but the gist of it is this. The word is, if I could put it this way, it's a contemplation. It's a complex contemplation on ancestry. And the proposition it delivers is, you know, people do have this dodem when they're in ceremonial uh, circumstances. They introduce themselves, not by their standard street name that you know, on their birth certificate typically, but they have another sequence of names that appears and right after their name is their clan affiliation. And they'll just say, whoever it is, Dodem. And without exception, uh, where I live, all the Dodems are animal. Which is to say, the sequence of your clan kinship is not exhausted by the human. That the ancestor of your first human ancestor is an animal. Now, in its withered form, we have this mascot thing all over the place. And that's a deeply misapprehended form of it. But it's actually your, what you owe allegiance to fundamentally as one who nurtured, who kept alive, and who enabled your first human ancestor. So it's a larger scale kinship than the human story would ordinarily allow. But it doesn't cultivate an, a kind of non-human identity. It cultivates an understanding that life is by definition not self-sufficient that all life forms don't have self-sufficiency, which makes them life forms. And, you know, human is very much part of that sequence. So whatever sustained your first ancestor functions, you know, spiritually and ecologically and, uh, you know, metabolically and biodynamically and even in the sequence of your memory as an ancestor. When you come to that realization, there's no such thing as first ancestor. There's first ancestors. It's always plural, you know, to begin. And then it often collapses into single lines for quite a long time. And then you awaken to the poverty of that, and the plurality of it begins to reappear. So these things are ultimately, they participate in understanding things mineral, right, and, and things atmospheric. And then you ultimately realize perhaps the deep mother of all our ancestry is something like terrain, it's something like weather, it's something like evaporation and condensation. I mean, it's something like grass. You know, there's a quite a fine book. They tell me it's been made into a movie recently called Wolf Totem, translated from uh, Chinese, 
and there's an old Mongolian man who's trying to educate a younger Chinese fellow about what he calls the big story. And he says, you know, the big story is not the wolf that we have to contend with out here all the time, certainly not the horse that you rode to come and meet me, certainly not the yurt that you live in, certainly not ourselves or each other. The big story, he says, is the grass. (laughs) So it doesn't come down to that. That's the teacher, you could say, is that the reliance, the failure of the quest for self-sufficiency, even when it comes to ancestry, is really the redemptive vision. Because I can tell you, I certainly saw that in the death trade, up, down, and sideways. The I'm not going to call it failure for the moment. Simply the lack of any sense of either obligation or mandate to learn this ancestry. What has been the consequence? This is not that hypothetical anymore. Because the North Americans have lived quite a period of time, you know, minus deep, I'm going to say lived ancestry. It's one thing to have something on the mantelpiece that somehow stands in for all of this. You know about that. You've got the, you know, the, the sequence of photographs of, you know, back to the grandparent generation. But this is family. You know, family, you could say by definition, is all the people whose voices you heard, whose names you know, or at least everyone you know now knew them. And at some point, that sequence, that that kind of unbroken transmission is broken. And basically anybody who looks like me who's standing on this continent in North America right now is a consequence of that break just as much as we are a consequence of whatever continuity we may be longing for. You know, you could look at the consequences of not doing so as the real tutor of this arrangement and not turn it into a got to or a must, or a new Ten Commandments. But uh, you could turn it into a a sorrow over realizing that no one intended for themselves or for their heirs homelessness. I'm quite certain that's true. Well, when people leapt across the Atlantic, speaking my own sort of ancestral angle, when they were driven across the Atlantic, you know, the cover story is they're seeking sanity and health and freedom and you know, worship and, and all of that, that's, and that's still taught in school. But you simply can't make the case that that's true by tracing their behavior once they got here. And their behavior once they got here established the foundation of what's come to be the dominant culture of North America. So we're unwilling even to learn how it started over here. And it did start, you know, for people who look like me, There actually is a start in time. It's not a fabrication. And, of course, America began fundamentally in Europe, which is to say that America is a European fantasy. And it's come from a certain era of Europe when there wasn't such thing as Europe as we know it today, certainly not the European Union, but not even those countries existed. There were small principalities and all the rest. And the people who could afford to stay, I believe, are the ones who stayed. The ones who made America were the ones who couldn't afford to stay, who were driven, who were fleeing beyond any ability we have to understand it, fleeing something so horrendous and so inextinguished that they fantasized a kind of a virgin territory. And even when they got here and they found that it wasn't virgin, the fantasy did not suffer. The fantasy was reinforced by removing those humans that they found here who messed with their idea of new world, you see. So you realize it's a kind of mania that masquerades as a kind of identity. And the founding in Canada, we we don't have the phrase founding fathers, but, but the founding refugees of our current regime, they lived almost immediately in the absence of what they had abandoned what they left behind, and what they had lost. And the poverty of that, I don't think, has ever surfaced deep enough to inform us in our current living. And for all of that, the consequence to the indigenous people that we found here has come to this. We live every day in the absence of what we lost. 
they have been obliged to live every day in the presence of what they lost. I'm not sure whose hell is more profound. Growing up in a society of individuals, it's difficult to even define, let alone grasp, village-mindedness. And since many of us in North America have never belonged to a village or a real community, we'd be hard-pressed to reclaim that way of life. No. No, we gotta, we got to lose the, all those prefixes. Reclaim, re-this, re-that, back to the land, all of that that mantra that somehow it's waiting for us to return to, number one, that it's somehow some kind of unsullied time before we went crazy, that we have the capacity to find it or to recognize it should we find it, and that it did not go as crazy as we did. I mean, just for starters, all of this language that automatically you know, gives us an opportunity to visit what we've clearly abandoned, this is a spell unto itself that has to be challenged by a change in language. And there's some consequence to that abandonment that North Americans have engaged in for a long time. And the consequence we could call inducing something, a feral quality, to what once stood beside you and was willing to know you and you know it as some kind of kin relation. Feral is a very good word here. Really, our ancestry, I believe, has gone feral, our deep ancestry, not only the human, as we said. And by feral, I do not mean a failed wild thing. There is no such thing as a failed wild thing. It's in the nature of wild that this is its only option. No, feral is a failed domestication. The most dangerous thing in the woods close to where I live in my farm are those house cats uh, that people uh, slow down their car long enough to drop out the window and keep driving. That's the most dangerous thing there is. I'm saying that, uh, that what we abandon and then what we disown and then finally what we find totally irrelevant to our days may be the most abandoned and subsequently the most dangerous part of us. Because when we reacquaint ourselves with it, it's not a benign sequence of consequences to have abandoned the maintenance and the care of that which was entrusted to us in the form of ancestry. That's what I think is happening now, to be honest. I think the kind of you know, marauding the countryside, looking for meaningful, symbolic ceremonies and, uh, and, and taking them from wherever you can get them. And this kind of strange syncretism of boring a little here and a little there and calling it you or imagining that it's all of this, you know, cultural patrimony somehow in the world to fill the hole that you don't want to learn as a dominant culture in North American. You just want not to feel it anymore as if the feeling is, is, is the real conundrum. It's the real affliction. And I'm saying, of course, it's not the real affliction at all. It's the unwillingness to learn the whole that's the principal affliction. You know, one more thing, if I'm not taking up too much room here. I have a school. It's called the Orphan Wisdom School. If you're interested in why it's called that, I could tell you. But one of the things I've done is I've declared 
certain patron saints and matron saints that are what oversees, I hope, our uh, enterprise. And one of them is the character who's known to contemporary history as Doubting Thomas, who is one of Jesus' disciples. I love this guy and hold him in very high esteem in the school when I'm teaching. It's, first of all, he's horrendously misnamed, but it would be a, very much a sign of our time that we would misapprehend what he did as him being doubting. In fact, what he did was, very briefly, the, you know, Jesus appears out of the tomb. There's 11 remaining good guys, and 10 of them say, that's him, that's him, that's him. And they bow and whatever they do. And uh, Thomas is going, the equivalent of, I'm not sure. And they all look to him like his faith is failing. And I would say to you, absolutely. His faith is failing in its cowardly apparition. His faith is failing because he has a love instead. And his love for that man and for the time they had together and for the dreams that they must have nourished and all the contemplations that they must have engaged in in the downtime in between all the public events, all of that cashed out in that moment as his willingness to lean forward and touch the wound that is a sure sign that the man beloved by him is dead. He learned his death. That's love. And faith is preemptive in this regard. Faith makes sure that you don't learn the ragged edge of what you long for. You don't learn how things came to be as they are. That you just extinguish the longing by taking somebody else's something. But longing has an immense teaching capacity for us, I think, now. Let me distinguish it from desire. Uh, Desire is that thing that is a stranger to none of us, whereby in its pursuit, you're trying to extinguish it. You're trying to end desire to get to satisfaction. It's not just sexual. It's at every realm of desire. That's the project of desire, is to find its end, which of course is a phantom and temporary end, but still, that's the project. The project of longing is to long. It's not trying to stop. It is in the nature of longing that it somehow has its own, its own song to sing. And when you're really singing, you're not trying to get the song over with to get to the last word, just as when you're really dancing, you're not trying to get to the end of the dance. You're dancing instead. When you're loving, it's the same thing. When you're longing for ancestry, when you're longing for you know real depth to your days, you're not longing to learn everything so that you don't have to long for that anymore. That in fact your longing is one of the manifestations of your ancestry and the fact that it's not a one-way street, this longing, that you may actually also be longed for. And the consequence of this abandonment is that you've lost all sense that it's reciprocal. You've lost all sense that your own ancestry, human and otherwise, could actually have some longing for you and that your longing comes from there and that it's a kind of love song that a time before you is singing to you which you mistake for affliction or for emptiness. I'm trying very hard not to revert to an attitude of seeking direct answers. And listening to you speak this beautiful poetic prose, you seem to be inviting us to break that habit. So Stephen, for us fledglings just learning to sing and trying to answer this love song of our ancestors, yearning for guidance, is there any you could give us as far as a method or initial steps to start along this journey of remembrance? Well, you know, again, to practice what I'm preaching, I'm not sure that there are steps, and probably that's not the best characterization for what you're asking about, at least not in my answer it wouldn't be. There's no program. You know, that program mind comes from the thing (laughs) that we're trying to do something about. (laughs) You know, it's pretty hard to cure the addiction while you're still drinking. 
and it is in the nature of addiction to prescribe a solution for the addiction, which includes continuing to use. That's a hallmark of the addictive mind, right? And, and man, we are deeply addicted to misanthropy, and we're deeply addicted to the thing that got us here, which is, you know, a stratagem for relief, right? So, so how do you contend with that and try to get to sanity without invoking the versions of sanity and the prescription for sanity that comes from the craziness? Maybe this is a way. It's not a beginning any more than you can jump into the beginning of a river, but it's some kind of initial move just at the beginning of you you trying. It could be this. Rather than fill the hole, rather than stop the hurt, rather than seek relief from the loneliness, rather than try to arbitrarily and in a lazy way begin with an assumption of some kind of regal root that is somehow still informing you, we could begin with a lot more humility at a much smaller scale than the trumpets and the angels and say something like this. If we are willing to inhabit the poverty that we are trying to get away from, this willingness itself becomes the love song that we keep trying to hear, that we sing it first. And the singing takes the form of the willingness to know in a deep way the time that we're in. If I could use a slightly different vision of it, I love the idea of the rosary. I wasn't born in that tradition. I've never had one, but I love the idea of it anyhow. It's like I've never drank coffee in my life, but I strangely love the smell of those roasted beans. <laughs> As if loving it will do, you know? So it's the same with rosary. And the thing I've been thinking about rosaries lately is what's happening as we're thumbing that through our fingers? And maybe... One of the things that's going on there is it's a kind of, it's a memory that's being staged rather than being involuntary, that it becomes a deliberate a scheme for remembering a what in particular. Well, what constitutes your good fortune? But it needs a steep reassessment of good fortune to include heartache, to include many of the things you and I have been talking about for the last while, that good fortune doesn't mean everything that you'd seek for yourself, you know, to solve, to soothe. That maybe good fortune includes whatever prompted you to begin that search, which, of course, is the longing for the absence of. So you could begin to put up your little tent in the crater of what happened, in the crater of the, you know, the ancestral flight from the old country, all those things, that you set it up there. And that you don't mistake that for an ages-old valley that somehow the gods themselves crafted. That it's more recent. It's at least half of it is humanly wrought. And if you're willing to learn the place where these kinds of deep losses and poverties detonated, it's the beginning of your willingness to proceed as if it's so. And self-hatred or misanthropy, is not an inevitable consequence of this realization. Because I think these realizations are both midwifed by and also the parent of sorrow. That's the strange thing of it, you know? The willingness to really see these things in the, in the way that I've been talking about them doesn't seem to give way to to anger, to hostilities, to finding the bad guys, uh, and things of that kind. Nor do they go to paralysis or impotence. They go to the, a certain mandatory sorrow that people of our time must have as a consequence of their awakening, of their becoming alert, of their emerging into an inarticulate adulthood. This is the requirement. I don't know if it's the program. But it's the requirement. It's why, you know, we ache for some kind of programmatic, clearly articulated, ceremonially induced and recognized, as they call it these days, rite of passage that signals that our personal childhood is at an end. 
Well, I'm talking about something similar for the end of our sort of cultural childhood, our cultural adolescence, which is still insisting on proceeding as if, well, you know, that was then, this is now. You know, I didn't do that bad stuff for 300 years ago, and uh, can't we all just get along? And the answer is, well, not without this poverty, we can't. And I would say, though maybe I'm not in the position to say it, but probably it won't stop me from saying it now, that we may become slightly more trustworthy to people more at home than we are if we're willing to stop trying to get home and begin to live the depths of the poverty that are our roots, in so doing, being willing to align ourselves with an ancestry that doesn't seem very promising, instead of trying to align ourselves through affect with people whose ancestry is still recognizable to them. We may become more trustworthy, the more sorrowful we're willing to become. It doesn't sound like becoming more authentic right on the surface of it but I'm not sure it isn't well the cold black sea waits for me 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 the cold black sea waits forever the waves hit the shore crying more 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 Cold black sea waits forever. The tornadoes come up the coast, they run. Hurricanes rip the sky forever Though the weather's changed The sea remains the same The cold black sea waits forever There are ashes spilt Through collective guilt People rest at sea forever Since they burnt you up Collect you in a cup for you the cold black sea has no terror Well it seems that this denial and refusal to feel all of these things plague us and you know we refuse to feel the sorrow and the grief of our ancestry of our brother and sister animals and plants that are going extinct we refuse to feel the sorrow of our human family members that die and even ourselves and we're obsessed with youth and attached to a kind of immortality and considering that death feeds life what has caused us to fear this ultimate process so deeply? You know, I think it's absolutely a historical event. You know, people in, in answering, a, trying to answer a question like yours, which is, which is a very well-wrought sorrow, you know, the, the question that you've asked, the direction always seems to go intrapsychically, as if that's the only fundamental reality there is. But there's this thing called history, you know, and as uh, Nick Cave so gorgeously said in one of his recent songs, he said, well, the past is the past, and it's here to stay. So <clears throat> we could take our cue from that and say, I think something happened. I don't think it happened all over the world. I don't think it happened to everybody. I don't think it's like a, a comet that impacted and, you know, everybody felt the tsunami. I don't think that's the way it was at all. I think in, in the particular case of the people who look like me on this continent, it would take the form of this. There was a time, or there were times, should be plural, when we had a capacity for home. That's the way I'd like to say it, rather than we had a home. We had a capacity for home over and above the particularities of place. 
And it was those particularities that granted us this capacity for home that we were able to somewhat travel with to the point where, in the context of a nomadic existence, no one was not at home because they moved from one place to another. Neither did they understand the entire earth, you know, all of creation, to quote, be their home. It was still specific. It wasn't throttled down into you have to sit at this particular place or you have no such capacity. And how was that place recognizable? At the human level, I think this is what it was. That people congregated or returned to that place in sufficient numbers over a sufficient length of time that everyone knew that their principal lived relationship with that place was transacted through the fact they know where the bones of their people are. I'm not sure that they had cemeteries as we understand them now, because as traveling people, there wouldn't be a place where all the bones went to, that the bones would be strewn across the path of their wandering. As long as they knew where they were, they're the whisperings of home, not the taunts of home, not the absence of home. Everywhere where the grass grew well, that the animals brought the pastoralists to every one of those good grass places, the quality of their grass was partly underwritten by the fact that old family members and ancestors were buried in that very place, which made the grass green. And they followed the animals to their people. When they drank that milk, and when they ate that meat from those animals, they were absolutely being fed by their ancestors in every physical and metaphysical way that that could ever have been understood. And that is somehow strikes me as the warp and the weft of home, that it's a combination of the specifics of place, which is why I mentioned topography and wind and current earlier. It's the dynamics of place. That's a warp and the weft is memory. And those two things together weave the shelter that you live inside of. And this is true symbolically, spiritually. It's true psychologically. It's true mutually. Your lived life together is transacted in the context of what I just said. Now, there are natural catastrophes that can eclipse the scenario I've just described. But by virtue of being natural catastrophes, they would never be understood as the annihilation of the scenario I just described. Sooner or later, they would be gathered into this understanding. What produced North America was not a natural disaster. What produced North America was a more or less spontaneous flight from what had already ruptured, badly ruptured, the scenario I've just described to you. And, you know, economists can tell us aspects of it, and they're right. You know, the loss of the commons, the driving of people off the land towards urban centers, you know, the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. These are important things to learn about because that's how the story I'm talking about took place. But the, the story is rarely told. If you look at the photographs of those immigrants that ended up in Ellis Island in the United States and, and Gros Isle in, in the St. Lawrence in Canada, what you see is you would expect to see a certain degree of distress or torment or, or despondency or trauma in the faces perhaps of the older people who never imagined that the, you know, the latter third of their life would be lived in a place that they knew not. So you'd expect to see that, and you do see it in the pictures. But the thing that strikes me enormously is the babes in arms in these immigrant photographs have basically the same look on their faces as the grandparents and the parents that are holding them. Now, how to understand that? Because it's a kind of a record of a, unfolding disaster that's not natural and it's this loss this compound loss of home that's being miscast as a search for freedom it's a freedom so confounding now that we're so confused by it that we cannot distinguish freedom from an utter loneliness of no capacity to feel allegiance to the place that you're at I remember hearing you say in an interview that you can't just wait until the 11th hour 
to figure all this out. It's a life's work to prepare oneself for death. If we are able to do that work and remember these stories, but we're not able to give our heirs or the earth our bodies potentially because of the way the death... Because of chemo and all kinds of things. The yeah. chemo and, and the embalmment and the caskets yeah. and the whole thing. Mm. Since we're not able to do that, what are we able to give back with our death? It's our manner of dying. Our manner of dying is the gift that we have. You know, this is a very tricky question, this question of gift, of giving back. It goes in the direction of sacrifice. But the sacrifice is it, frankly, it's a pernicious proposition because the etymology of the second half of the word comes from a Latin word from which we get the English word to fashion, fice, fashion, to make. And the prefix is, of course, sacred, to make sacred. That sacred is a fashioned thing. I mean, what kind of bruised psyche and wounded ancestry gives rise to the idea that humans are in the sacred making business? It's not, I'm not pretending I don't understand how it comes to be that way, but the word itself gives us pause. So we might rather say that rather in trying to ongoingly engage in sacrifice or, or kind of pound of flesh guilt offerings that are a consequence of us realizing how badly we've mangled what was entrusted to us, we might come to this thing that has a tone of redemption in it instead of a tone of, uh, of kind of sort of gross contrition in it. And it could be this. Do we have anything to give to the world, to the life that has given us our life, to the people that will follow us, to the, you know, to the food sequence that has granted us our days, etc.? That doesn't require us taking it from somewhere else in order to have it to give. I mean, in the present moment. And my answer would be, there's a few things. One of them is your manner of dying. Your manner of dying, you do not steal from some other life form, from some other human, from some other era, from some other culture. It doesn't have to go that way. You can die understanding that your manner of... I'm not talking about the cause of death now. I'm, I'm going to use the word style that your style of death is the only thing you have to bequeath to the people who come after you and to the place that your body is going to end up in that will not prompt a family disagreement about who gets what, that will not send lawyers' kids to private school, that will not end up on a sale table for quarters at a yard sale somewhere. It might be the only thing you have that won't end up in one of those three scenarios. Your manner of dying is a gift beyond our understanding of what constitutes value because it is a, it's a piece of meaning, strangely enough, that the people come, who come after you will either be afflicted by because your manner of dying was so, was so involuntary and so um, um, uh, kind of encrusted by grievance uh, that the meaning of your death to the generations to come is whatever you do, don't friggin' die kind of tone. Or your manner of dying whispers to the people that come after you that, friends, this is a kind of an achievement that you'd never seek as an achieved thing. So imagine that it's possible. Imagine that the time to come is written partly by how you die that your understanding of what it means to die is not divorced from your understanding of what it means to be alive. And once you realize that you're going to die in the manner of your living, the next question becomes, what are you waiting for? Are you waiting for a terminal diagnosis to become a contemplative genius? Is that what it is? Do you honestly imagine that no matter how you lived, that your dying will not bear the fingerprint of your manner of living? Because it will. That's all it will be. Your manner of dying will bear faithfully all your convictions about life. So the, the kind of redemptive vision might be 
that everyone's death before our own is a chance to get a PhD in the way it is. And if that's the case, we can learn from them that it's our living that gives our death meaning and that we have to begin now. You know, as someone who farms a lot, I'm often asked for agricultural advice and and the, the answer I get asked in some form or another more than, excuse me, the question I get asked more than the other is, um, when's the best time to plant a tree? And I know they mean day or night or season or I don't know what, uh, phase of the moon and so on. But my answer is always the same. I say, best time to plant a tree about 25 years ago. And they look at me with the kind of visual equivalent of some of the tone that you've asked me your questions in, which is to say, that's beyond confounding. That's cruel. Because somehow you're, not only do you refuse to answer the question apparently, but that you're answering it in a way that makes life seem to be impossible and futile. You're talking about the past as the only way that anything, well, you're encrusted by the past, basically. So I would say to you, the reason I say 25 years ago is because I'm answering the question that they haven't quite articulated, but is absolutely there, which is, how can I have a tree to sit under right now? That's where the question is really coming from, right now. And so that's why I say 25 years ago. So there's a sense of too lateness about it. If you want to have a full-grown tree to sit under today, but you have not proceeded in the last 25 years, as if that would day would come when you'd want that tree shelter. So... What's to be done? And the answer is, get planting. Why? Because there will be people 25 years from now who are going to ask the same question. And the miracle will be that you have been willing to proceed as if they will appear. You start tree planting as saplings now. You're not going to see the fullness of that tree. No, you won't. And there's some real grief in that. And you're doing it on behalf of people you will not meet. And yes, there's some altruism. But there's the grief that informs the whole operation. And just when you think that this is a, a recipe for selflessness and for service to the future, here's the rest of the story. How did you know how to even ask for when's the best time to plant a tree? Answer is because you'd seen trees already. That means that whether you seek out this wisdom or whether you don't, the truth is that even in our blighted time, there have been people who have been willing to proceed as if we ourselves would be in the time and in the crazy soil that we're in and they planted. And if it wasn't trees, it was struggles. And if it wasn't struggles, it was, you know, approximations of wisdom. And if it wasn't that, you know, it was old tribal clothing that they somehow kept alive just as an undershirt or whatever it is. You see, we're not operating in the absence of all these things. We are today operating in the abandonment of all these things. So the, the, the proper redress to this kind of abandonment and betrayal, frankly, is remembrance. So, I mean, I think we're close to the end of our time here, and maybe you've gone over, but I'd, I'd offer you this as an understanding of remembrance vis-a-vis -vis dying now. I worked with a lot of people whose instinct was to make home movies. That was their big thing. As they're dying to make these movies, you know, we have the technology now, it's so simple. And they were dispensing wisdom and all of the rest. And if I were to ask them, why are you making this? They would answer that, well, they're not going to live long enough to see their kids graduate from school or, or get married or whatever it is, or see their first grandchild. So they're, they're making these things as a voice from the grave, so to speak, that could somehow triumph over the limitations of a lifespan. And I'd say, well, I understand that's what's prompting you to make them, but why are you making them? Not for whom, but why? And no one ever answered, but my take on it is this. Nobody makes a movie choreographing the way in which they hope to be remembered if they really have faith that the future generation will remember them. And so all of these lunges are towards a kind of vague longing for just being remembered, not immortality, just some kind of endurance for a while. You know, that you don't slip beneath the waves, gone for all time, 
with no consequence to your days. So rather than trying to choreograph the way in which you'll be remembered, which is basically the hero's journey, one of the things I've been pleading for for years is to die not trying to get remembered, but die remembering. Because this you can still do on behalf of those people who died fundamentally not remembered. And this is why I answered you earlier about learning ancestry and not invoking someone else's as a kind of pan-human kind of Walmart for the soul that you can go into and choose an ancestry that more becomes you. You know, I mean, I'm 61. You know, it's not ancient, but I can see it from here. And I can tell you, I'm doing everything I'm doing for people your age. I don't know how old you are, but you have a young sounding voice, younger than I feel to this morning anyway. (laughs) And that's the allegiance I'm acting on. And I have deep apprehension about the world that people my age and older are handing over to you saying, well, good luck with that one. You know, while we're maximizing our income generating years and Monsanto continues and on our watch. And so the very least, as any opportunity that you've granted me to wonder aloud about these things with you, has to carry that sorrow in it too, you know. And there could be a lot of self-hatred in there, uh, but there isn't because neither one of us have the time, not at you at your age, not me at mine, that this world needs something else of us, that's something that looks human, not the betrayal of human, not the denial of it, that it seems to me in a troubled time, Humans are troubled, and maybe what we've achieved talking together this morning is that we've been willing to be troubled aloud together for a while, and maybe there's something there. Well, thank you. Thank you for wondering aloud with me. I'm sure my, my mind will continue to spin this around into many vortexes to come. Believe me when I tell you it's It's an honor for you to ask me these things as if I might have something useful to say back. Hopefully I kept up my end. And thank you for honoring all the people that gave me a chance to learn all this stuff, which is what you did with your questions. The jaybird's calling. My mind grows dry and thirsty. As the memories linger. Drifting on the wind. That, my friends, was and is Stephen Jenkinson. Along the way, we heard some orphan sounds coming from Australia, a song called Mosquito by the Aussie band The Necks, followed by Niels Fromm from a piece called Tristana, and Lou Reed with Cremation. Rate us on iTunes, subscribe to the newsletter, and help out the program by donating. We can be found at forthewild.world. Thank you so much. Sweet smell of pine, tall western cedar, drifting on the wind through the mountains like a river. Sweet smell of pine, tall western cedar, drifting on the wind through the mountains like a river.